Do you remember the Mazda commercials from Thanks. like so. ten years ago? Yeah, that's great. My sister and I would always, uh, yeah, we would always like joke that because like we used to drive Mazdas all the time. Uh, and uh, so we'd like, you know, as we were driving to elementary school or whatever, we'd like look to each other and like pretend like we were demonic children from like a, a horror movie. And we'd be like, zoom, 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 father, driving a car. <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was ridiculous. It was super fun. <laughs> this is podcast episode 31. You'll always have JavaScript on August 10th, 2017. And now, there's been a situation, I believe. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk31. Hello. Hi. Hi. How's it going? It's been a while. It has been a while. It's uh, it's been only a little over a month, so that's pretty good. Right, we're we're now. That might be a, a record for 2017. That's true. We are hovering around double, the uh, the time between episodes that we that we had uh, that that we constantly uh, consider our ideal. But that's all right. Double is better than quadruple, and half is twice as good as uh, as uh, point. So we're getting there. And at least we're, we're doing it in order this time, too, because we recorded PodKit 30 the day PodKit 29 came out. Actually, Before. did PodKit 29 get released after we recorded 30? I think it did. Something <laughs> strange. That's true, because... Either way, we have uh, sh- we have follow-up from both. So. Yes. Well, I, I didn't even know I we did, did so we let's, did let's hear, let's about, hear it. about it. I'm, uh, I guess, the follow-up hoarder. Yep. It is one-third of the email in my inbox is from PodKit follow-up. That's very strange, but I'm happy for you. All right, let's see if we can remember what is being discussed because it's been a long time since Podcast 29. Yeah, yeah. Um, should I just read it all verbatim? Go for it. Ian has uh, a, a paragraph. Here. Yeah, go for it. So, Ian R. Buck said on July 5th, in regards to Podcast 29, the sentiment that we want students to be issued computers that they can learn to program on and explore as full computers amuses me because SPPS iPads. Brandon compared Microsoft's attempt to create a community around Windows 10 S to enacting uh, martial law in Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica. But if Microsoft had just half the charisma of Admiral uh, Adama, yeah. it would work. That's fair. Admiral Adama is pretty cool. And then he says, hey, Brandon, got any uh, cute n- nicknames for Edward James Olmos? Yeah, Eddie J. He's a pal. That was uh, better than I could have expected. <laughs> I did. I did Eddie read J. this email. I just think that it is not uh, not in my email that I have currently logged in on this computer. Oh, yeah, and uh, Brandon and Ryan, Ryan, you both replied to it as well. And then the last sentence is: uh, If you look at it upside down, it's higher level. Cracked me up at an in an opportune time. My family was listening to an emotional song. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that's in reference to, but uh, that's okay. Uh, we recorded that two months ago, so I don't re- I don't remember. Right, right, right. I bet if I look at the share notes, I can figure it out. We'll have some real time follow up in a moment. Y- yeah. Okay. All right, um, and then I can uh, go to yeah. pocket thirty feedback too. Y- yeah, also go for from it. Ian Arbuck. Of Hi, course Ian. it is. Whoa, feedback before the episode even publishes uh, in Insider Scoop. Uh, then he says, all legal Java code is legal Groovy code, so I bet Brian could write something that would compile in Groovy. That's probably true. The only thing I remember about Groovy is that it was uh, way less strict about semicolons than Java. True. So so here's what I'm going to have to say to this, because I, I remember talking about Groovy on that show last uh, last month. So apparently, I have random topic of the month uh, going on so last time it was groovy and this time it'll be react native yes. so what will it be next time when we record in september i don't know obviously it's the iphone but um <laughs> that's uh, that's true yeah so uh yeah um so um so, uh, co-host follow-up on the groovy topic i did not pursue groovy after um you know after learning it because it turns out i don't like uh i don't like dynamic languages anymore 
That is absolutely fair. You you will always have JavaScript if you want. Right. Well, okay. So now the the difference between JavaScript and Groovy though is Groovy runs on the server, and so server code should be type checked and client side code. I whoa, don't care. Whoa, whoa, whoa! No JS is totally server code. Yeah, I don't use that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, while I was in Sweden, all of the ads I saw on YouTube were in Swedish. I thought that was odd since they know uh, from his account that he prefers English. Yeah, I think the um, I think the uh, language detector is super aggressive. With um, IP based scanning, mm, that's yeah. true. I think they, I think the local ads probably pay better than generic language ads. That's fair. Yeah, we call those generic language ads um, English, by the way. <laughs> true. Yeah. Zoom zoom. All right. I think that means it might be time to talk about some of our topics for this episode. We have some very hard hitting, insightful, deep topics here. Maybe so. So, uh, so we'll we'll make Brandon uh, introduce us to these very exciting deep topics. Sure. So, speaking about language based ads, uh, I was uh, I opened up the blue application known as Bookface, and uh, on it, I, I I found this nice little sponsored post from a nonprofit organization about uh, how we rely on, quote, digital infrastructure built by volunteers, end quote, and what it means when that infrastructure fails us. Um, And I think uh, being intrigued by what is probably only considered clickbait by me and people in our industry, (laughs) uh, I I clicked through it and I gave it a read and it made me kind of sad, uh, which is why I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, because I'm interested to hear what you all think of it. Uh, so basically, the, yeah. So yeah, let's uh, let, let's um, let's read the first line because I think it it can paint a really nice picture for everybody. For sure, go for it. The next time you drive over a bridge, imagine if its maintenance depended on the efforts of a single volunteer. There you go. That's the first line. I think that that um, sums up what the article is generally about. Yeah. All- so the the idea of digital infrastructure makes me think of things like um dns servers the dns network um underseas cables the running of lines the more physical things about the networking and routing of things because that's kind of what a highway is to me you know the highways are the infrastructure whereas you know technically something like stoplights um and road signs and things are part of that but they're not really the same thing you know yeah. as the hard physical thing that you drive a car on for example yeah i don't know if um i don't know if there's an equivalent in the physical world for what um this post is calling digital infrastructure so brandon in our show notes called it open source infrastructure which i think is a better term for it so do you want do you want to talk more about what that means yeah for sure for sure so when i read this article i thought of um, examples in software in particular that we've seen stuff like open SSL and package managers and stuff like that. I think one of the, one of the biggest things that rubbed me, rubbed me the wrong way about that first sentence is how it described, uh, this software, uh, just described it's the, the tools that it's referring to as quote, uh, being maintained by one person, by a single person. And I think the thing that messed, messed me up a little bit about that. Uh, is not so much that there aren't cases where uh, this infrastructure is managed by a single person, but that it kind of um, it kind of maligns a field for for these kind of special cases. And instead of talking about how we need to how we need to like support people who are building these things that we rely on, it kind of talks about how we need to almost like privatize it. it it's a little weird, a little weird. Um, but open source infrastructure for me, as I mentioned, is stuff like open SSL. Um, really core base software packages stuff like curl and git and um other sorts of tools that we use if not directly every day um tools that are used by software that we use every day curl being like you know it, the c url library among other things uh, uh, among being the executable that that you might use in order to make http requests from a shell so it, it's definitely some of these have come from uh, or be, been led by one person uh, but to say that like uh, that like volunteer ownership of critical code is is like in and of itself kind of a, a harmful thing uh, just struck me as strange for somebody uh, representing this entity to to kind of say. I'm interested to hear. So I when I when I read it, I kind of had that that 
um, admittedly rather strong reaction to it. I'm interested to hear whether you all had the same the same reaction or different reactions when you kind of skimmed through it here ahead of the show. Yeah, so um, I follow Sean Larkin yeah. pretty uh, pretty closely these days, and so Sean is one of the maintainers and developers. He works at Microsoft, but he develops and maintains Webpack. And um, since since I've been following him, he's been promoting the um, I don't know what the technical name is, but it's it's basically the Webpack Fund. So it's um, you know funding their time working on it. Yeah. Um, and and you know all the hosting costs and whatever other costs that they might have, whether that be going to conferences to promote or um, you know whatever. Um, and I think uh, I think what this person is getting at because in the article they use a, an example of Ruby gems, uh, either the site or a package being vulnerable and and needing additional support. And 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 certainly there there is the case to be made that you know imagine if Webpack disappeared tomorrow for some reason like no future updates ever well i mean presumably the community somebody would be smart enough to pick it up but um you know if all of the people who've ever touched the code today didn't come back tomorrow it would be broken but that's true of probably everything right. um and and so the funding would help hire new people it would take a while but sure we could probably put it back together again so i think it's um you know it, it's it's sort of a mix and i think it uh the, there's a fine line between uh, what infrastructure we're talking about um, and where where in the stack somebody can be responsible for it. Um, you know, a lot a lot of this technology that we have now is made purely off of goodwill, um, and it it just it just will happen that nobody will ever get paid for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think you're right to bringing up the Webpack kind of funding model and other other folks are doing this too like tj holloway chuck is doing that with uh apex now apex uh started out as a uh a tool used to manage uh aws lambda functions and uh services that kind of interact with it and now it's kind of developed into this like uh business so like he he builds out packages under the under the apex name and sells them to to companies individuals and he also, I, I believe, is accepting like consulting through through Apex as as a company. Uh, and I th- and yep. I think uh, so. TJ has written some stuff, and I should pull it in for the show notes here about uh, how he feels about being kind of a, a, a single principal maintainer of pretty many pretty core software packages, stuff like Express for a while, uh, which he originated among other things, Super Test stuff like that, Super Agent. I mean, you can imagine. This, I mean, for example, Vue has one primary yeah. author, which is Ev- Evan Yu. But uh, the the Patreon he gets, I think it's like fifteen thousand dollars a month or something like that. So I mean, he he certainly can make a living off of that. Absolutely, um, yeah. You know, and he can work full time on it. But if if he didn't and he disappeared again tomorrow, I think there's enough people in the community to pick that back up. And if the Patreon was for the company and not just him individually, then almost certainly it would be possible to uh, to fund further development. Yeah, for sure. Now, I think for some of these cases, you know, having a strong community is good of volunteers. But if something is a little bit on the edge, you know, there's some community issues that are going on. And, you know, what if, if all the core maintainers leave due to something, then it's kind of just left there in the open. And I think having some sort of financial backing for people working on it is a good motivator and a good way of ensuring that progress will keep being made um i think something like sean larkin for webpack and angular cli and other things he's involved with is is good because that's you know one dedicated person who's going to be working and getting paid for um community outreach and support and hype and development work and i think that can push these tools to be more um, legitimized because there's probably more time going into it um, as well as uh, more secure, more featured, or if, as long as these people are kind of left on their own to develop it with the other um, maintainers and community members around that framework. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I guess like... Th- so I, I wanted to mention this one yeah, here yeah. too. So 
Uh, on the view some page or another, it says here, if you run a business and you are using view any rev revenue generating product, it makes business sense to sponsor view development. It ensures the project that your project product relies on stays healthy and actively maintained. And I think um, in the open source community right now, um, if we if we say that the digital infrastructure that this article is talking about is yeah. that, there's not enough of that going around. A lot of these companies abuse open source. It's a free thing. And it'll be actively maintained. Expectations will be hoisted on these people forever. Um, and there's just not enough corporate backing. Um, I don't want to say big money, but any money. Yeah. Generally being put that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that and yeah. i think like part of it too and I, I guess part of the reason why i reacted in the way i did to reading this article is that um i think that if uh that that i i i totally agree with you all that like that is the responsibility of anyone who's making money off of the software to, co to contribute to the people who built who created it if they wish for it to continue and if and if they sincerely don't care then they uh then they they will uh, they may kind of reap their own rewards. Um, but I think, or rewards, quote unquote rewards, feeling very poetic today, I guess. Uh, but the, I, I think that you're right, the, that the, the core takeaway from this ought to be that uh, not necessarily that, opens, that an open source model for software is harmful, but that uh, contributing to open source projects and expanding uh, expanding the community surrounding open source software and making sure that it's a, uh, a healthy place where people uh, can feel comfortable contributing, no matter their uh, no matter their background. I think that's that's really key here for sure. So what I'll ask um, each of you then is um, in your in your in your work that you do now, because we all have jobs, which is which is great, um, and we are all software developers, which is also great. Um, do you think that your business would would maybe not do a monthly sponsorship, but but be open to donating to one of these projects, any project. I would certainly hope so. We have a ton of use of a few frameworks in particular, um, but I think yeah, I think w it could take some work. But I do think someone in my company could be persuaded. We're large enough that I think that could be the case. Yeah, and uh, we just need to make a an argument for it. I I do believe we've done that before on multiple occasions. Um, I. I'm not super close to the financials of that, but I believe that there are a couple of situations uh, where we uh, have a, a role like that already. And another thing that is really prioritized, I think, for us is uh, contributing back to the, to the uh, tools that we use in the software packages that kind of underlie a lot of our work um, where, where possible. Yep. Um, so we uh, try to kind of walk the walk and not just talk the talk uh, where, where we have something to contribute. I know there is some talk... Um, about having a strong, a stronger public open source uh, face from my company. Um, so I've been a little while, but I know there was some talk and at least having like a public blog about things that we're doing. You know, there's yeah. some ideas that people are, are interested in. So there's some some talk about it, and I'm not sure. You know, maybe there have been cases where some manager on a team has donated some to something they're using, but I'm not. I don't know any specifics. So I'll I'll, I'll speak for my two-ish companies here. Um, I, I don't know what my client that I'm actively engaged with has done in the open source community. Um, but I think within my team, I'm, I'm certain we could uh, find some funds to, to do a donation and, and, and use it as a, um, you know, so kind of like community outreach kind of thing. So yeah. uh, we work a lot with farmers. I bet you can't guess where I work. Um, and, and, and so with farming, we have, we have a lot of community out outreach, too. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we could spin it the same way for, but, but for open source communities. Um, but now for my own company, Doherty, um, I don't think MSP. So this, this branch that I work at has ever donated officially as a company to a project. Um, and I, and I don't think that we have it in our corporate culture yet. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if, um, you know, enough of us actually could show a good reason to do it, um, and complain about it enough. I think it might happen, but but I think it would take a lot of work. I think um, it can often be an advantage to a company because it's kind of a little bit of advertising. So it you know that could maybe pull it out of you know marketing budget right. or something too. Now, so w what's interesting is that we have the spectrum here. So we have my company that's sort of uh, 
you know, still still back in the old enterprise corporate mindset. We have Brandon's company that actually has done this before, and we have Brandon or Brian's company that kind of wants to actually get in, get into it. Um, so I think um, I think a lot of businesses fall somewhere into the spectrum, and uh, it's it's uh, not always easy. I mean, a startup probably can't afford it necessarily, especially if it's a really bootstrap startup without funding, yeah. and you know, big corporate has no clue what they're talking about. So, you know, it's somewhere in there. Yeah, I getcha. Yeah. And I think, like, part of it, too, is that, like, there, there's a there's definitely a distinct difference between, like, sponsoring a project by hiring its maintainer uh, or, like, right. bu- buying hours, kind of, to, to work on it or something like that. And then there's, um, yep. like, donations, like, straight-up donations. I think that's probably more in the line of what we've done in the past. Um, but... Yeah, and and I think I think the donation route is better than buying hours. Actually, yeah, I get you for sure. Like it's just so hard. It's so hard to um, it's so hard to account for people's time in like okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pay for twenty hours from our company for this person. But what does that really mean? To like, do you get twenty wor- twenty hours worth of value? Like, what does that right. mean? Um, and it you know it's like story pointing. It's a fake yep. thing. So I, I I like the donation route better. Just contribute money, and they can spend it what they think is prioritized. For sure, but exactly. Just, you just know that it's going to what they think is important. Absolutely. Rather right. than maybe getting you know, your company's um, drive, yeah, you know, skewing where they're working with. You know, as long as they're not buying Teslas, you know, it's fine. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Well, anyhow, uh, I mean Mazdas actually. Sorry. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Mazda, Mazdas are great. Uh, so if I, yeah. So, uh, suffice it to say, uh, onto a very different note, Ryan, I know you've been working with React Native of late, which is going to be super fun. Um, already has been super fun for yes. you, I'm sure, and it's going to be super fun for me to talk about. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Okay, so React Native. Um, wow. Um, it's really cool to actually write um, an Android app again. So, um, in college, I wrote an Android app as part of one of the um, HCI courses. And. Um, you know, it's been a while, and I remember now how much I hated writing Android apps because, um, well, there's this thing called Java, and it's just clunky beyond belief. Um, but also just 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 having to do all these little things to make anything decent enough for a person to use. There's just so many of them. Um, you know, one one in particular is the uh, scrolled list component widget thing. Um, you know, in Android, you have to be aware of all these memory constraints, and you know, there's all this stuff, and 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 so like you you have to do all this work, and React Native makes this a lot easier. So you, you code, and I know this is unbelievable in JavaScript, not <gasps> Java. Yo. What? You can you can use Flow um, though. You can use Flow, which will help with the type thing. Well, okay, so here <laughs> well, we'll talk about that in a second too. So um, I've been coding in React Native, um, and so you might know. That I am a Vue JS coder, pretty much all the time, full time, pretty much. Um, and and so Vue and React are similar in, in that they have components and their philosophy around those components, pretty similar. The data model is pretty similar. Um, the 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 flux layer, the Redux or the Vuex layer is pretty similar. Um, there's a lot going for both of them. They both know what they're talking about. Um, so I wasn't total. It wasn't totally alien to me to use you know, set state to mutate state or, you know, uh, call an action to make a mutation into my uh, Redux store. You know, no, nothing seemed complicated um, in and of, of itself in where it belonged. Putting it all together, though, was the complicated part. Mm-hmm. And I bet you didn't guess the tooling is what killed me first. Always. Um, always. So um, uh, out of my client's site, we're working on this app for one of their clients, as it turns out. Um and and so the, one of the reasons we picked a React Native app is because we wanted to leverage some of the offline capabilities of an app, so it doesn't have to have a constant internet connection. Because um, you know we we in the future we'll be able to use uh, progressive web apps, but um, due to the Safari situation, we can't yet. So React Native to the rescue. And so we wanted to get started quick, so we used this um, template we found called Native Base Flat App. Flat App is it, you know it looks nice and kind of skews towards the material design. Um, which is, you know, Android-ish, but it, it doesn't look terrible on iOS, at least. Um, and, and so we paid for it, and we're using it, and it's actually pretty good. But, um, you know, some of the some of the weird things, so I tried the open source one, the free one first, 
Uh, it's just native based kitchen sink and it just would not compile no matter what I did on any of the computers I tried. Brandon tried it for me. It didn't work for him. I mean, and, and you know how these projects are. If one dependency is misversioned, it just fails and it's with a mystery error. So uh, once I bought, bought the, the real template, you know, it worked fine. Um, I was able to copy another team sort of React Native app that was a little different kind of copy the updated versions that they pieced together and figured out how to use so now i'm using um, react 16 and whatever the latest uh react native nice. is which i think is uh 44, 44. Yeah. yeah so yeah i mean i you know it took me about a week and a half to like get used to it and get comfortable with it but um you know initially i thought i bit off more than i could chew but as it turns out it's fine i get it it's okay yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I I know that like the uh one of the things that kind of I ran into when I was starting out with picking up React Native was how many of the errors uh like just at how many different layers there could be errors. Uh, oh, everything. so many layers. Yeah, everything from like on uh, the compilation of the native source to uh, the uh, kind of packaging of the of the JavaScript to uh code signing after the javascript has been packaged to like uh the verification of the of the signature after the code after the javascript's been packaged and stuff and everything's been bundled up and everything's all right except for the part where it isn't um to stuff happening uh with watchmen uh with the with uh uh yeah watchmen that's a good one right so while brandon was helping me troubleshoot uh the kitchen sink version um my watchman died and it would not respond. I restarted and it still wouldn't respond. So Brandon's advice was to uninstall it and reinstall it. And it's like, uh, well, that's ridiculous, but okay. Yeah, it's so here we are, and uh, it's not good. Uninstalling and reinstalling software is a solution, maybe in alpha mode, maybe. Yeah. So um, let let's continue the story of React sure. Native. So out out at my client site, um. You know, we're, we're, we're a corporate entity, and, you know, we have to be secure. So I'm on the guest Wi-Fi because I don't officially work for the company. I'm just a contractor, um, which is fine. And so what's interesting about that is the, the Wi-Fi situation it is such that React Native with Expo, the kind of framework, I guess, that I'm using, it requires the phone and laptop, the computer that hosts the application, to be on the same subnet and to be visible to each other on that subnet well for whatever reason out at the site can't do that the phone cannot for any reason ever see the computer right. and pre- presumably this is for security reasons you know um you don't want devices sniffing other devices and stuff well that pretty much prohibits me from working in the office so then i have to work here uh at home which is great for me but um it, it really impacts you know the the life cycle of the project so it turns out not only is the requirement for react native having a mac and a computer and uh you know react experience but also wi-fi i um i'm working to get a mac at at my work and i would like to at least i think eventually we're going to be making my application more responsive right now we we have a we have a min width of over a thousand pixels and Ooh. we want to get rid of that so yeah. I think, you know, you can do uh, debugging on iOS devices over either USB or maybe wireless yep. in the next version or the current version. Uh, I don't remember. So uh, there has been a situation, I believe, where I was able to debug something that I was seeing on my device in Safari over over Wi-Fi, but only because okay. I had it set up as a dev device and some other stuff. Yeah. But, you know, at my work, I can't get on the internal network. I have to go on the guest network, and that's completely locked off from things. So I would likely need to contact security, you know, go through all the loopholes to get this device registered for the internal, you know, like um, company device list, even though yeah. it's my personal one. It's really tough, and I and I understand that companies um, need to protect their intellectual property and uh, stuff. But um, I will say that modern development suggests that there's another path, and that path is to have that network, a guest network for guests using normal computers that don't know what they're doing, and an open network that is protected but just not locked down 
for developers because the developers probably know what they're doing probably probably and if not maybe if not if not at best they'll mess up their own stuff first (laughs) right exactly and i think that's as much as you can ask for otherwise you're just getting in the way um so yeah react native it's great um my app it doesn't hit the server side service yet um but i mocked all the data so you know it's moving stuff in and out of the redux store it's really cool it works it doesn't look great because i don't know what i'm doing design wise um but it's it's really cool to make a native app with it i mean it's a week and a half and you can have an app it's amazing yeah i'd like to try using it at some point either react native which i think would be a little more familiar to me because i'm more from a web development background but i would like to or go full swift but i need someone to work with if i'm going swift i think because I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, Swift, I mean, Swift can be I, I th- kind of painful. I think I think um, I think there's Swift five coming out, so that's painful, isn't it? Um, well, that'll have ABI stability. So sure, they lied last four times, so they won't lie again, will right. they? Right, it, it's internally mm-hmm. a- ABI stable, right? So <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. Um, I'll believe it when they start bundling the Swift runtime at a system level rather than at an app level, yep. but we'll see when that is. So the final thing I'll say about uh, React Native and the experience that I've had so far is um, it's really cool to do all this stuff and to 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 for me to have... I mean, I, I, I know React a little bit. I did some last summer, and I, you know, I've seen React code. I follow all the React developers. I get it. But I've never actually used, used it, um... And to, to do all of it in a week and a half is really cool. Um, but it is really freaky how complex and terrible all of the tooling is. And it's not just the tooling. It's the dependencies. It's the not dependencies. It's the peer dependencies. Mm-hmm. It's the dev dependencies. It's all just a complete mess. So you should really watch out for the dependencies. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think uh, a, a Create React Native app or a React Native app that you generate from the React Native CLI directly has something on the order of 10,000 uh, dependencies and, and dependencies of dependencies. It's kind of a lot. Yep. Is that like 10,000 things in a node modules folder? You bet it is. I mean... Like number of packages? Yeah, yep. Basically. Uh, and that includes crazy. all of their dependencies, off, uh, uh, obviously. Yeah. So. That's absurd. And that's before you've installed so, like, I think... And I think that, right, that's before you didn't install the stuff you actually need to make your application. Um, and I think that's a symptom of, you know, various factors like, you know, user land progressing faster than, than kernel land, although it's framework land or language land, I guess, in this case. Um, but but also that the JavaScript is really built up on these um, open source layers that need infrastructure funding. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I had to do it. <laughs> it all goes back to the first thing. To the first thing. It sure does. Zoom, zoom. <laughs> truly, truly. Okay, so let's talk about the next thing. What's cool? MDN is cool. That's what. MDN, or the Mozilla Developer Network, it is the probably the single biggest influence I, uh, I had when I was learning how to build websites uh, because MDN, or developer.mozilla.org, I... Uh, basically documents everything everything from uh javascript and how the language itself works css html all the different elements and tags that you might use uh all the different selectors and stuff you might use in uh css any sort of properties like that uh it's all documented there and while mozilla doesn't necessarily like they're not the be all end all uh like they're it's not like reading the w3c standards for any of this stuff However, uh, this documentation that Mozilla has created is probably some of the most readable, uh, quickly referenceable documentation of its sort on the web. Uh, and recently got a bit of a redesign, which is super cool. So if you go to developer.mozilla.org, uh, you can see what it looks like. It definitely brought it into uh, kind of the modern era for design, and both both in the sense of like uh, just what it looks like as a website, right? It, it looks a little bit more modern in comparison to the other one, which I don't think had changed substantially since uh, 2013, 2014. Uh, but this also pulls in a lot of the new Zilla branding elements, the new uh, colon slash slash logo, among other things. And I don't know, it's just cool. I really dig the new Mozilla brand identity. So uh, as, as, a, as a brand nerd, I'm cool with that. Um, and also, it's just like a really neat interface. Have you all run into this yet? What do you think? Uh, I like it a lot. Yes, 
Yes, yeah. I, I did run into it. Um, I use MDN all the time. MDN is like the only docs I use for for um, JavaScript. and Well, I use CSS tricks occasionally too. But Yep. So yeah. uh, I, I used um, MDN back before it was MDN, which is when it was Ooh, MDC. You hipster. I know, yeah, I'm such a right. hipster. That's right, Mozilla Developer Connection. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think uh, I thought it was Developer Center, but I don't Developer know. Center, MDC. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, It's been a while, but uh, the good old days, I guess. So, so, so good. Well, I think that's about all I have to say about that. So let's talk about another thing. Uh, this is something I added. I'm just, I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about what, what do you enjoy, what do you most enjoy when you are working on an application? So um, some things I threw out as, some, you know, breakdowns that I would consider valid would be like the structure of the application, more authentication of it, widgets or small components that build this application, the build process and tooling, so like Webpack, um, writing tests, uh, rewriting, like kind of refactoring, um, styling, um, I guess supporting other developers working on this, or uh, rewriting large parts of an application using new frameworks. And um, Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think for me, one of the things that I really like about an app is uh, kind of a combination of refactoring and structure. So if I'm setting out to, to, um, to add in a feature or do something new, I really love to like visualize the changes that it, that it kind of uh, affects to the ecosystem as a whole. So like if you're adding in a new API endpoint or you or like you're adding in it something entirely different, some entire entirely different set of functionality, you have to figure out how that interacts with all the other things in the app that are similar, uh, all uh, all the things that you might want to interact with in the future. How can you how can you make life easier for yourself uh, next time you have to revisit this stuff like that? And you know these things that I pointed out are things that you can get at any of these layers, but I think for me. Like that sort of planning, that sort of orchestration, I think, is what I find probably definitely the most uh, something I can get sucked into quite a bit, which is why most of my side projects never have any execution because I just make a structure <laughs> for a thing and then I get bored right around we get to the build process. Yeah. Um, so I guess I guess one of my favorite things is um, so uh, I'm a full stack developer, so I, I, I typically work on the front end, but um, I also do a bunch of front uh, back end stuff, too. So. One of my favorite things is actually getting to the point where I can uh, hook up the front end to the back end so that I can send and receive stuff. I, I think yeah. that's um, a lot of fun because, you know, I can I can mock up all my data structures and uh, it looks cool on my side. But then when I when I get back to the back end and I actually start bringing data down, you know, things change and you have to do some optimizations and you have to do some normalizations. And so I think it's a lot of fun. I, I like doing that. The other thing I like to do uh, is just answering questions. So uh, I like being in the helping, like, assistant role a lot because, um, you know, it's a lot of fun. You know, you get to teach people stuff and you get to learn stuff uh, about their approach and why it's not working or why it is working. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think there's definitely a lot to be said for um, that that moment where you can, like, actually start talking to these services, right? Yeah. And I... I don't necessarily know if I'd characterize my role necessarily as full stack. Um, but no, you're I think, the full business. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's uh, I, yeah, the, that's, it's, it's a, it's a kind of a, an interesting scenario because I definitely do, do, do backend programming it from time to time. And I do front end programming from time to time. Um, but I think definitely I myself as somebody who thinks about the structure more frequently. Um, maybe. So you're an architect. And I guess that's the thing. I guess. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Here I dreamt I was an architect. That's my like 45th music reference for this episode. I apologize. Uh, I if if any one of our listeners can tell me which uh, which uh, band sings that song, uh, they uh, I, I owe them a coffee. Uh, at the Minneapolis and St. Paul coffee shop of their choice. Uh, hit me up on Twitter if that is you. Uh, <laughs> okay, good luck, Ian. <laughs> he's, he's just he's just gonna ask uh, he's just gonna ask Google and uh, Google's going to tell him immediately. Yeah. So but I guess you got your winner. Fine. That's and fine. I bet at about now he's starting to write a tweet to reply to you. There you go. <laughs> yes. For me, something I like is 
lately I've been poking around with Webpack and trying to optimize this to reduce the size of our, our app bundle and get rid of things we're not using. Um, so that's something I've been interested in lately. Um, I've been using the tutorials that Sean Larkin has been put up, has put up at webpack.academy. They're quite oh, nice yeah. and I'm excited for more and uh, I think they were quite helpful and I kind of used the structure he was going through in in the tutorials there to kind of redo the one in my app at work. Yeah, so so overall, like how, how do you find those tutorials to be? It was pretty good. I, I don't, I learned just different practices, I think, from there and a little description on what um, some plugins do that I hadn't used before. Um, cool. He, he explained, you know, the difference between a plugin and a loader a bit. So some more specifics with just strict definitions and hearing it from someone describing it sticks a little more than reading it, I think. Definitely. Yep. So it's just good to kind of get that um, going, o- going over it all again and making sure I know what they do instead of just assume. Um, otherwise, I like I, um, some refactoring. So an example recently, um, much of this earlier part of the summer was spent um, making you know, um, pages that require a service that has all, has all of this data and then handing off the data to all these widgets. Instead, having all of the API calls being at a per widget layer so they're all independent and then doing dynamic routing, dynamic loading of widgets on pages based on um, a big tree structure and then it's all pretty, uh, all all very dynamic and so that's been, um, that's been a lot of fun earlier this summer. Kind of just you know, it was like a month and a half or two months of work, month and a half of work just from um, refactoring. And so I knew kind of what I was doing the whole time, like what the end goal was. So it, yeah. there wasn't a lot of, um, oh, we should talk to the BA and then we need to have a meeting with the PO and discuss business logic and how this is going to work. It was very straightforward. Um, there were some technical challenges we definitely hit that we had to work through. But that was just, you know, more local to our code base rather than. Um, the direction of the application as a whole. Yep. I also like styling. That's always fun. But I don't yeah. want to be stuck doing it all the time. But I, I, I do really like taking two days out and doing nothing but styling and small amounts of logic. So um, that's one always of the makes things, for a good day, I think. One of the things that I really would really like to have is like a Chrome plugin that you tell it the uh, domain of your front-end project. And then, you know, every, I don't know, five minutes or something it just regardless of which window you have open um if it's if it's open it'll take a screenshot of it and then at the end when your project's done it can uh compile them all into a gif like thing or a video or whatever it is and um it can show you the evolution of your of your product visually i think it'd be so cool to have that yeah, would be sure. awesome um so i saw in um uh in safari technical preview the one that came out a day or two ago um you can right click an element go into your web inspector if you select that element you can do capture element screenshot oh well and then it will it's easy in safari <laughs> it will screenshot the entire thing for you now I'm, i can't figure out where it actually puts that screenshot but uh i saw on twitter at least that it was possible and you know it, it takes a screenshot of the entire page it seemed quite quite cool yeah that so was cool kind of probably tie into something like that yeah, oh, I think it that... said could not capture screenshot in, in <laughs> Google Docs. Oh yeah, that's funny. Let's try a more simple site, but so, yeah, there there probably could be room for a a plugin at some point. Yeah, I think that'd be super cool to have, and it would also be cool to show your um, you know, your your project holders and project managers and you know, all, you know everybody basically because it's just so cool to see, and I, I think that's a thing that most non-developers don't understand like its process on its own and you know regardless of what other, what other additional processes they have the the software development process is a discrete and definite thing yeah for sure well next up i think uh ryan you're going to a conference aren't you i i am going to a conference and i and i talked with you about this uh some time ago i don't know what we were doing yeah, yeah. but um you know, we we've uh, we've t- we've talked about um, open source North here. I think last year probably, um, and so last year I went to open source North. I didn't go this year, and uh, I think I think one of the reasons I didn't go this year is because the quality of the presentations, while they were some good ones, um, in general I felt it was somewhat subpar. I guess maybe mostly. Mm. 
um you know it's a smaller conference it's one day it, it has um you know it's it, because it's a smaller audience maybe some of the bigger speakers don't show up so there's less good stuff so i'm going to midwest js this time and uh my company doherty is uh being wonderful and paying for me to go so that's that's cool shout out to them um they didn't sponsor this episode by the way um but uh, I, I can um, give you some highlights about some of the talks I want to attend because, yeah. um, you know, I, I've been in sort of this reacty world lately, um, but I'm also a view guy. So um, I picked out some React and Redux talks. There's a cool Graph, GraphQL one that I'll, I'll go to and almost certainly not learn anything. Um, uh, there's one about TypeScript and React, which is, you know, an unusual pair considering that there's flow. Um there's um, cool stuff about Vue with TypeScript and integration with Webpack. Um, but the one I think that I'm looking forward to most, which is sort of funny, is the blockchain app development with JavaScript and Sawtooth. It's, yeah. it's just so out there that it, it either has to be so good or so bad, and I, and I just can't <laughs> wait for it. Right, you did some right. blockchain work earlier this summer or spring, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did, in fact, do that. So that's why I'm so interested in it, because it's 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 either going to be like what I did, which is kind of fake your way through making a blockchain thing, or it's going to be real, and maybe it's easy enough, but I, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, really, at its core, the blockchain is just another implementation of the flux pattern, am I right? Um, <laughs> let, me, let, let, me, uh, let me carry the one on that, carry the zero and five. Yes, you're right. <laughs> oh man just kidding that's one of my favorite yeah. jokes to make to people to people who are talking about blockchain stuff just like uh how pattern matching is just regular expressions um, um no that i will argue <laughs> against that <one. laughs> uh but it's so great it's such a great pun it's such it, a great it, it, pun. It, well it's regular expression somewhere but not not where you thought Shh. <laughs> <laughs> for real no these look, these look like great talks i'm kind of sad that i did not hear about midwest js until like a week ago uh, yeah you know i think it's really cool uh i think it's 400 dollars for the ticket um which is sort of like on the upper end of like well now i need a company to pay for it right um i mean it's not wwdc for example but um still you know it's not something you just uh, go to on the spur of the moment i guess yeah, for sure. For me, it's that's kind of an interesting price point too, because for me, it's both at the at the north end of uh, it's not so expensive that I uh, that I that you couldn't do it here. Yeah, that I couldn't do it, but it's also at the south end of it's just expensive enough. I kind of wish I were traveling to go <laughs> instead of instead of having it be uh, in town here. Right. Yeah. So what what's also cool about this is that I'm going with three others potentially from the office. So nice. Um, We'll we'll get to um, kind of uh, collect our notes together, and then um, one of the things that uh, Doherty asked of me and us is to sort of put together like a hack night worth of content. So I'm kind of hoping that we can sort of do that as a group, and you know maybe just rotate through our you know 15 25 minute sections, and you know just talk about a cool thing to introduce the idea. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for definitely. sure. I just got a coworker. Yeah, go for it, Brian. I said a coworker who was at that conference at the Wisconsin yeah. Bells. Yeah, Wisco. He, and uh, he said it was, it was quite good. I didn't hear too much yet, but I know uh, uh, um, TrackJS had a talk there. As you yeah. yeah, Todd Gardner, yeah. yeah. You, you know, I, I re- regularly recommend a TrackJS to everybody at work. They, and, and for whatever reason, they're just terrified of having to pay for something. So let me tell you. Something about infrastructure. <laughs> so, sure. do you know what time it is? What time is it? It is time for new Twitter followees. Woohoo! Oh, man. We made it there already. Yep, it's true. Here we are. What? All right. Well, I guess as is tradition, I'm first. And as so is first... tradition, you have 200 people that you followed. So yeah, more or less. I think Brian's got me beat this time. Uh, at, at the Somehow, spoiler. yeah. I don't know what I did. This month was crazy. I, I just don't have as many words to say about the people that I followed, other than the ones that I've pulled up here. But yeah, I followed probably f- twenty five people. <laughs> so I, I don't know how you episode. do it. Uh, uh, regardless, our first one here is at Binary Gary, who uh, works for Web Dev Studios, uh, which is a remote uh, WordPress agency. Uh, but Gary lives in Jacksonville, Florida. He's a super cool dude. 
uh, kind of plugged into a lot of the folks I, I see here he's friends with folks I know who are with the nerdery and other kind of shops in town uh, but he's just a super cool dude a super cool dude um, talking recently about stuff like SVN and uh, you know it, it, it's, it's that kind of really really awesome software engineer account to follow uh, definitely still a person uh, and I think here's here's what uh, here, here's why I really want to share him with you today. Here's a sentence from his bio: "Quote: If code is poetry, I write an anapestic tetrameter, uh, and that's that's all I have to say about that. Uh, so definitely definitely take a look at that because he is a cool human. Uh, next up is Suze the Tech Muse, and Suze I uh, met her at uh, the uh, Minneapolis Junior Devs Meetup back when." It was uh, hosted at uh, Software for Good relatively recently. Uh, Suze is a total rock star and, uh, you know, tearing it up with presentations all over town this past couple months. Uh, So you'll probably run into Suze at some point uh, if you have not already. uh, And uh, another great person to follow for that reason. Uh, Next up, Adam Bezemek. He gave the presentation at JavaScript Minnesota last week. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, whenever that talk was, it was a time ago. Uh, <laughs> two weeks, he, I think, something. Two weeks, yeah, but that makes sense based on the number of days that today is. <laughs> uh, he gave a talk on atomic design, which is super cool, um, and uh, I think that was a, a pretty well executed talk. Uh, so it's always cool to follow people uh, for these reasons. Keep an eye on what he's up to. And last but not least is Ian Coldwater. Another person I met through uh, JavaScript, uh, not, not not through JavaScript, uh, in part through JavaScript and in part through the Minneapolis Junior Devs Meetup. Ian volunteers uh, to to help make sure that uh, that that particular meetup runs smoothly, and is just generally all around a cool person who's interested in security engineering, in addition uh, to uh, kind of general software architecture. Uh, I'm hoping that Ian will uh, be interested in giving a talk on uh, kind of security engineering in JavaScript. Uh, in the near future and, oh, and that would we're, be we're talking about that yeah we're, we're kind of in talks uh, right that right now which i uh probably should not share with the public <laughs> before those are locked in um but uh a killer presenter a uh, super cool person who's involved in making uh kind of making the minneapolis and uh minnesota tech communities uh kind of do better and uh challenging all of us to kind of be better in that regard so definitely a cool person to follow uh, those are kind of the four highlights from my Twitter followies uh, over cool. the past couple of weeks. Yeah. How about you, Brian? So something happened this month, I guess. So uh, <laughs> firstly, uh, machine pics. Just some cool machine pictures. That's all I got about there. Fun stuff. A lot of GIFs. Um, next one is uh, Jessie Char. Uh, she seems to be a, uh, a cool tech Silicon Valley person to follow who was on uh, Anderson Cooper for a video of feet on an airplane. You'll understand what I mean if you go to her feed. Um, Net History Pod, my new favorite podcast, the Internet History Podcast. I don't know. Did I mention this at the last episode? I don't remember. I don't think so. But it's awesome. It's done by um, at Brian MCC, I think, is his name, Brian McCullough, who um, interviews people and is also has done chapters on the history of the internet from netscape ish to kind of today and um so he interviews people or he does more of a formal kind of a chapter i think he's turning those chapters into a book as well cool so it's just super interesting a lot of good first party insight of what happened and more modern things too um next is don melton who was one of the original um, developers on WebKit at Apple. And he was interviewed by uh, Internet History Podcast. Uh, I listened to an episode with him on it um, last weekend. So I highly recommend that episode. I will um, link it in the show notes too if you are interested. And then next, uh, Max Rudberg, who is a um, developer, or not a developer, a designer, He's done some mock-ups I've seen on Twitter talking with Steve Trouton-Smith and John Gruber about um, the the bump on the iPhone 8. Um, but I first heard of him many, many years ago 
through jailbreaking, he created a theme called Glasgart or Glasslart, just um, a jailbreak icon theme. Um, so he's, I think, had his starts in the jailbreak world and has moved on to other things too. And then last today at lunch, I got a notification that the account All the Brian's Pod followed me, and it seems to be a person probably named Brian who's interviewing other Brian's and making a podcast and there's a Brian bot on Facebook Messenger. That is such a, a hilariously novel idea. <laughs> and if you look <laughs> at the followers of this, it is like only Brian's. That I was is... going to say, I, there's one other person who I follow who also follows all the Brian's pod. Wow, that is incredible. Is <laughs> I I am uh, that is just incredible. You jealous? I uh, almost am. <laughs> if you I wonder what they would do if you start tweeting at them because your name is Ryan, which is close, but not the same. Well, it, they would get onto their fringe episode, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Okay, so I'm I chatting haven't... with it right now. I just chatted, I am Brian. It says, sorry, you're not a Brian. Now what? <laughs> oh, oh. I was messaging it, and um, I did the, there's um, like a... Um, uh, trivia about the name Brian and so I did that at lunch today I know nothing about the name Brian apparently <laughs> um, but I also was then going to do it you can interview it interviews people I guess and yeah. um, I I choose okay do the interview and then I answer and then it loops back to the beginning so it kind of like breaks out of its loop and crashes or something mm. so it's got some room room to improve there Brian but yeah so we'll see if anything interesting happens out of that. What about you, yeah, Ryan? For sure. Oh, um, hmm. what is what is this Twitter thing you keep telling me about? I don't I don't know if I actually followed anybody really in this period of time. And I try to keep my um, Twitter followees limited. Although, how can I read all the tweets if I if I have all these people to follow? That's Fair. horrible. I have to go through every so often and just unfollow people, and it's the saddest thing. But I go crazy if I don't. So. Yeah, I I just uh, I just accept the futility of existence. I guess <laughs> twenty eight hundred uh, is a lot different than f- uh, four hundred fifty or three hundred fifty. Yeah, that is fair. That is fair. Seven times that much. Yep. I mean, I I get overwhelmed with the people that I follow now already. Now, to be honest, some of those are like things like The Verge and uh, Ars yeah. Technica. And and so when you have those news outlets in there among the people, you know, it's like, oh, well, I'm not going to fish through all of this to find the good stuff. So just up to the top I go. Yeah, I yeah if I – I'll sometimes go 12 hours between checking. Like if I don't check between lunch and then yeah. like midnight, it's yep. like 600, 700 tweets and I just go like, oh, no, and – and then I like pull out the a computer and iPad and just like get through tweets pretty quick. So so my feeling on uh, the Twitter fatigue is, you know, if somebody shared an important link throughout the day, I'll most likely see it in one of the subreddits I follow, which have a much lower post velocity, or Hacker News, which also has a lower post velocity. Haven't missed a tweet since 2011. Nice. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've scanned through rather quickly. Yeah. Yeah. D- many dozens of times, but <laughs> for the most part. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, I get you. Well, I guess it's about that time. Uh, Ryan, it you is. may not have any Twitter followees, but uh, I don't know. You do have a Twitter. About... Where can we yeah, find you? Do you have a Twitter. <laughs> Where can you find me on the internet? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Mar, and of course, on my website, which is RyanRapperSaid.com. And now I have changed the referral section so that you can learn about the thing that I'm referring you to before you are referred to it by me. So does does that mean you added a description? Or Yes. Now, a funny story about that description. Those had always actually been in the system, but I had set them as the title attribute on the links. And they are still set that way, too, but now they're just also shown as text below it. Nice. Maybe I should do something like that on my website, which is brianm.me, where there are also referral links. I probably was inspired by Ryan. I don't remember where it, when I started doing that. Um, or you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L. And yeah, uh, that's probably the, that's, that's all I got. Nice, nice. Well, you can find me uh, most places. Uh, 
probably on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN. Or if you swap the underscore for a dot and put it in your web browser, uh, you can find my website, which is brandon.mn. I, I haven't updated it in a long time. I don't think it has anything particularly interesting on it. Uh, but it is written using Glimmer components, which is the, uh, the, t- the template and uh, component engine that underlies Ember, uh, which I kind of uh, I kind of dig it. It's, it's kind of neat. So uh, maybe something will come out of that. Maybe not. Only one way to find out, and that is if you look at it. Another quick aside about Brandon.mn, which I didn't mention to you guys, I almost managed to lose it by not paying my domain registrar. Uh, Stop that. My... <laughs> because my domain mm-hmm. registrar happened to... Uh, happens to have this weird thing where like you have to pay using their uh pseudo currency so you have to like yeah. put money into a prepaid account and then they draw against the prepaid account and i'm like why would i keep money in a prepaid account because that's just money so maybe what you I'm need to do lose. is is um because i know you can buy domain names sometimes in blocks of more than one year so maybe yeah. you just need to do a, like a five year upfront. That'll make it even harder for me to remember it in five years, and then I'm going to be like, "Where'd my website go?" <laughs> just put it on your Google Calendar to yell at you every week at every hour. But who's to say I'm going to be using Google Calendar uh, in five more five more years or so? Uh, the Google Borg commands it. I don't know. I already stopped Hello, using Ian. Google Docs. Other than oh, uh, well, that's that's good. Other than right now when I'm using Google Docs to read these show notes and google um, hangouts and i'm sure and you did google a google hangouts search to to you. i've probably done a google search and i am using chromium which is like google chrome but different yeah you bleeding edge you yep, so i that's guess why i my use my computer does the crashing thing i use <laughs> safari technical preview so that's kind of the same thing i, use I could chrome. be running night webkit nightly but i'm not quite that aggressive uh, actually, I've been I using. Uh, like to. I've actually been using Brave on the phone. Is nice. guys, is Brave move. that Opera browser thing? No, Brave is the um, Brave EFF, is the browser that Brendan uh, Ike made uh, when he left Mozilla. He wanted to make his own browser um, that has AdBlock built in, and then also on top of that, make a way for advertisers to get money, and then for people to support websites using blockchain. Right. Right. What what engine does he use? Is that using Gecko uh, or? It is a fork of Chromium on the phone on Android. Okay. I do not know what it is on the desktop. Huh. Um, so that that's pretty much the show for this week. But I, I have to tell you, uh, this is a great show. But it is bizarre to me how we did not talk about this new iPhone shape. I have no idea how that didn't get into the show notes since all of you are iPhone users. I mentioned it that is fair. At, when talking about Max Redberg. The the bulge or the yeah, the, yeah. whatever they call it the, I don't know I don't know what he calls it either I'm I'm reading him I'm reading that right now and that's why I keep seeing it and I and I think we need to do a a, a better job next time at talking about this absurd new iPhone that 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 could very well be in one of your hands by the next time we talk so there's yeah. that it was See, in so- Marquis Brownlee's hands check out well that his, that was a ch- that was a fake one hopefully probably I think it was a yeah it didn't work but I think it was a like a, a uh, model case model yeah 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 i think so um i don't know i i don't i don't know enough about this to judge this rumor accurately but is this our after show by the way <laughs> this is probably our after show yeah accidental yeah. uh <laughs> totally planned uh so um i so so what do you what do you think about so i'm, I'm reading the the max uh redberg uh like twitter feed here so the the top image on the feed right now is sort of this this iphone silhouette with the bottom being um variable os space at the bottom and then the top of the phone being app space variable app space so what do you think about this layout do you think that's cool bad good i like it i think i really like how the the menu bar status bar incorporates itself with the the bump of the cameras and the uh speaker grill I think okay. that's really seamless, and it's a good way of occupying space that would otherwise just be empty. So it, I've got questions yeah. for you then. If you like it, and, and I hear that you do, uh, do you think that people will be prized to see the f- device offered in white as a front color? Um, No, and that's because they've offered white for several years so far. And the white version does have a 
you does the bar for the speaker grill, there's the dot for the camera, and there's the dot for the ambient light sensor slash proximity sensor. So they have But now it's gonna be a big white thing protruding into the middle of a black bar or whatever colored bar that is. Um I if they do do white and black, I would hope that their UI would change depending on the color of your phone. I agree with you. I hope Similar so too. Similar to the, the boot logos that are different on an iOS device, depending on the color of the front-facing glass panel. Okay, so that's cool. So what do you think about the variable OS space? I think that is a good solution for the, the home button. I think uh, the... Uh, solid state touch ID button on the iPhone seven was a good kind of lead into that. Um, so I'll, I'll miss it... feeling a, a physical bump of where the home button is. However, there's sure. no touch ID. So face ID better work pretty well. I would hope they would put something else down there. I've seen, you know, rumors that the navigation controls on a uh, navigation yeah. controller are going to be down there. I don't know exactly what I think there. It seems like a good use for space, but not a I lot of so. use for, for a text. Um, now videos are going to be a little strange because there's the, the notch at the top of the screen. So, uh, the video might be offset a little bit, a little strange. Um, hopefully there are APIs to hide and show that button. Doesn't seem like there's much about color in there. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. I'm quite interested, interested to see what Apple has because there's this HomePod firmware has been ridiculous. There's so much that has come out of it. Yeah. And I... I look forward to 10 years from now hearing about how that happened, but I think uh, we know a lot of what to expect, but we don't know how it's going to work because we don't see this code running at all. And so I, right. I'm, I think it's really hyped up this new iPhone um, in a way more so than I remember in previous years. Well, right. And I think before this even, you know, before we even started seeing pictures of this uh, ledge design, um, you know, this is the, what, 10th anniversary iPhone? Yep. Yeah. So I, I think that's contributing to the hype pretty significantly. Um, so I think the design's super cool. Um, it also reminds me of this really obscure um, mobile operating system called Android um, <laughs> that has on-screen touch buttons for the bottom navigation. Uh, yeah. And it turns out, and I know this is unbelievable, that was a really good idea, it turns out. Really? Um, so I'm glad I'm glad that Apple, if they choose to put not only the home button down there, but maybe even a back button occasionally, sometimes, if the app has ordained such functionality <sighs> to be useful, I'm okay with that. It makes way more sense for a back button to be uh, on the left bottom corner than at the top left corner, for example. No problems. Just go and do it. Yeah, I guess. Mm, I, I don't know. I... I'll, I'll need to see it before I can pass any particular judgment on it. I think um, a thing that I could definitely see happening in that variable OS space is some sort of iOS uh, simulation of a touch bar. Um, and maybe this is like their justification for a touch bar, perhaps, or something like that. Who knows? I I feel like a back button... I don't like the idea button. of a, you know, if it inherits the navigation controller kind of button, you know, it may not, I don't think it should say back all the time. I, you I'd know, assume it'd be just be an arrow, right? Yeah. But that doesn't tell you where you're going back to. It, it doesn't and always mean anything. Yeah. yeah. It can and often so, not be semantic. I like having the label on it. Um, you know, there's a lot less text here. If there's a big old circle on the bottom of the screen where the home button would be. Um, I think, the back button is nice on Android, but at the same time, it doesn't always make sense to me. And it's, you know, it's a physical thing on Android. A lot of, the, well, especially nope. the older, older and cheaper phones have yeah more of a hard coded thing. And that, we're we're just gonna pretend those don't exist because those were dumb. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I I'm not quite sure what I think about a universal back button. I don't think it makes sense to always so, have it there, so, which is good. Why that it's and I agree with based. you. So, so what if it wasn't a universal button? What if it was app or app specified? So anytime the app would have shown the back button in the top left corner, it would just also or just only be in the bottom left corner. That I could see happening. Yeah, I I think that's pretty cool. Um, I don't know who it was, but somebody was circulating some designs they mocked up with this shape. And I they think were I putting... first saw it from Steve Troutensmith or retweets that he put out. Yeah, you you guys know the Mac names, and I, I don't know the Apple names. He's the guy who 
one of the first people who found this originally. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. He has a Patreon. You should all support him. I should probably support him too. Uh, he's great at reverse engineering and finding these little things in macOS. And yeah, he's been for sure. at it. Going, he's he's like one of my top ten favorite Twitter followers for the last you know forever. Yeah, for sure. Highly for recommend sure. it. So we mentioned that this came out of the HomePod firmware. Are there HomePods yeah. out in the wild today? No, uh, but they not have... publicly. So yeah, it's probably <laughs> internal to Apple. Yeah, mm. I assume that it was leaked pretty heavily. Someone probably uploaded it to the wrong server. Oops. Um, and it, you know, the links weren't published, but someone was able to get at this link by guessing what the URL would be. And it, it was a. So, you know, the developer betas and the public betas are stripped down versions of what they're they're working on inside of Apple. So they're removing right. these pre-release things and the next iPhone things. And so this HomePod, even though it's not running this stuff, it was since, you know, uh, Pod OS is, is running. Uh, no, sorry. Audio OS is running from the fork of iOS or a lot of shared base of iOS. It still has all of these yeah. things in it. For sure. For sure. <sighs> Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. So, and, and there are more things that came out of this HomePod leak, it sounds like, past just the iPhone. Um, I think some things about the HomePod, that it, it has a uh, maybe an LED matrix. I think that was something referenced in there. Not mm-hmm. a screen. Um, I've seen, yeah, I've seen a couple things about gotcha. Audio OS, uh, which is the name of the HomePod OS, by the way. Oh, gotcha. Um... I think that's what it was. I think, yeah, a lot of this has been about the iPhone 8. Oh, and there's been references to uh, 4K HDR Apple TV. Uh-huh. Um, also, in iOS, some uh, visual machine learning things, so it can tell if you're looking at, like, a sunset or um, a, f- a few other camera conditions. So I think there's improved uh, camera things, probably, that comes with the new camera system. Uh, it looks like the front-facing camera was also dual camera. That might be related to infrared um, and the internal name Pearl ID for something that people have been calling Face ID, which is you know kind of face detection. I, mean, I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I've heard that Microsoft has a really good platform that they've built that Hello. does something like this. Yeah, I don't know. I so Under surface we're, line, but. Working with a lot of that, there are many conditions where, so like there, there was a project I worked on where like face detection was a big deal, uh, not, not for authentication purposes per se, but even just like detecting that a face is present and that, not that it's like out, out of reach of a company like Apple or Microsoft to do well, but it's really, really environment specific in a way that. So I will say I've had, um, a few computers with the face detection for login, yeah. And those were limited to Windows, of course. I bet you can guess how great it was to have face detection on my Windows computer. Uh, it wasn't. <laughs> so um, I never used it, and it sucked. A fingerprint would have been way more reliable, um, whether it be a flat surface or a swipe scanner kind. Right. Um, but but at, one of the reasons it was so bad is because it was implemented not with Windows drivers on a Windows or Microsoft Wear product, it was implemented yeah. with the vendor's own software, with their own drivers, with their own webcam on their own laptop, which meant that they didn't really care much at all. They just wanted to say that they could, and whether it worked well or not, they didn't care. They just to check a box. Uh-huh. So I think if Apple does it, it will certainly be more integrated and probably work significantly better. Yeah, yeah I think for sure. It, it almost sounds like there's... Uh, I think there are some endpoints um, in there that would mean you get silenced your or your notifications get silenced if you're looking at your phone. So I think what would be interesting is, um, so I don't know how, like, the details of how the, the security works um, in, in iOS for the fingerprint. Like, I know it goes into the secure enclave and stuff, but, you know, what, what does that mean um, for, you know, facial recognition, like, like, to what degree does that get stored digitally, and then how is it secured? Because because certainly I hope that um, the the new iPhone is is at least as secure as as um, you know any previous version. Yeah, I think that's stuff something that definitely needs to be there. I think Touch ID seems so easy 
uh, I I get a little more worried about visual camera things because that always feels like less accurate, you know. Yeah, and and, and, and so just, what they're saying is yeah. that it could potentially be more accurate. So w- yeah. I think we'll have to see. Um, you know, a lot of people said, "Well, what if it's dark?" Well, it's infrared, so it doesn't care. So that's cool, but uh, we'll see. Uh, a what couple if, more. What if, Notes. What if you're in the sun? Like, doesn't that just bathe you in infrared light? I don't know. Exactly, exactly. If you're standing on a reflective surface, like say the snow, in right. uh, in uh, the state of Minnesota in the winter, you're uh, I don't all know. Maybe infrared. Maybe it uses a a a, um, a short spectrum in order of infrared light that you know, like you know what I mean. So like the sun yeah. is inf- is emitting. A, a fairly continuous stream of the same wavelength so maybe the iphone could emit a pulsed pattern or something yeah i yeah. I, I made I'm all that up i have no to idea see how how it works i think that'll be something quite quite nice to see at the actual presentation well, well to be sure. fair i didn't make up the sun the sun is real yeah, yeah. well i i, I don't know, is man, it though the earth is flat yeah. Well, I, on, I don't know. It's Monday, dark will, right is now. Is it going to be real? Is it this well, Monday? It's or dark right now, so maybe it isn't real. Two Mondays from now, we'll see how real it is. Oh, you're right. You're right. Actually, I'm going to go down to see that, actually. Yeah, I look forward oh. to hearing about it. Oh, well, I'm sure I won't be able to tweet for like seven hours after it happens because, um, according to uh, the government, this is the first solar eclipse since cell phones have existed in the modern world, which is amusing to me, in the U.S. Hmm. Um, and so the the likelihood of having any uh, data capacity will be zero. Hmm. Yep. Really? Uh, that's what the government says, and the government is never wrong. It, it'll it'll it won't work because everyone will be tweeting their videos of the solar eclipse. Yes, and they'll they'll be uh, burning their uh, CMOS sensor out of their camera as well as their actual eyes. Ah, uh, they didn't need the eyes; they needed their phone to work. So True. I found a, a couple more things here about the the leaked firmware. So Steve Trotton Smith uh, found some new methods on UI screen um, about corner radius um, and inset um, sizing, and then UI status bar has the split um, option, uh, a new visual provider system. One of the options being split, which makes sense for the the notch. Um, might support a tap to wake he says so do you think so it, it's pretty clear to me that the um the ipad wouldn't need to have the uh, little the little you know n- notched in segment you know not now i mean but in the future i suppose they could add it for some reason but you always kind of want a bezel on an ipad so i don't i don't know yeah but like I'm will there sure. ever Will there ever be like design consistency again? That's a good question. Um, I think they might make the bezels on the iPad even smaller. That I wouldn't be surprised to see. Um, you know, a notch on an iPad would make even less of a uh, impact Difference, than yeah. it would on an iPhone. For sure. Um, so yeah, that's that's interesting. I don't know. Um, yeah. They certainly have. You know, they could get rid of a little bit of space for the speakers or you know the battery so i think they could afford making an ipad a little bit smaller yeah or they uh, just make the screen larger probably keep the physical <laughs> size the same right exactly so i think the real question is what what would it be like to have the ipad with the variable os segment like would that just be where the dock is sort of yeah i could see that yeah i don't know it's interesting I'm very excited to seeing it, and I'm debating buying it, but I did buy an oh, iPhone 7 well, last year. Oh, uh, well, since this is the after show, which is not the fringe, this is the after show. Right, Brian? I was going to include probably up till maybe now in oh, the Oh, no, no, this, this, is, this is still the episode as far oh, as I'm concerned. It's just still, oh, right. It's the after show of the episode. Right, but not quite fringe episode. Exactly. Uh, we ha- the, the show title stuff will be in the fringe. So... Um, if I leave the country, because I got my passport, if I leave the country for work-related purposes, I almost certainly will buy a different phone for that international travel because of, uh, you know, reasons in America. <laughs> so that would be an iPhone because I heard, according to uh, the NSA, that they can't break it. So 
Yeah, iPhones iPhone. are more secure, and I think iPhones are some of the best phones for having support internationally and abroad. I agree. So for sure. Yeah. All the radios. Yep, all the radios, unless you buy the Verizon one, in which case, no radios. That's fair. I do always buy the Verizon one. Yeah. Yeah, don't do that. It's kind of a problem. <laughs> yeah. AT&T for life. All right, maybe that should conclude our after show. Goodbye, after show fringe listeners. Bye. Hello, real fringe listeners. Goodbye, podcast. Zoom, zoom.